Oh my god, no way. Oh my god, you're finally back. We haven't talked in so long. So how was your time with Colin? Good? Okay, that doesn't surprise me. It seems good. Okay, AJ, tell me about AJ. That doesn't surprise me in the slightest. So have you met Brady? No? Oh, that's so weird. I feel like we've been doing this for a while. I missed you. It's so nice having you here. You wanna go? Let's go. Let's go. It's gonna, it's gonna be a tough game, just like any other Big Ten, um, Big Ten game. Uh, every win's hard to obtain. You know, foot on the gas from here on out. You know, gotta keep getting better. We got we got a lot of goals for this team and, and, and for this for this season. So, gotta keep uh, trying to obtain those. And while their goals might have to change a little bit, as we've said a couple weeks ago and last week, the playoffs is out of the picture and probably the Big Ten championship game as well. But this week they have a chance under the lights in Kinnick Stadium to continue winning. Absolutely, and. I know it's fall now, leaves are changing, but a leaf has turned over now in the Iowa offense. That's right, Colin. But hello, everyone. Welcome to Before the Kickoff, the Daily Iowans weekly pregame show and your number one source for Hawkeye sports. I'm Brady Bear. And I'm Colin Carruthers. We're going to break down everything you need to know before the kickoff. Today, we're going to take a look at the rich rivalry between Iowa and Wisconsin, compare the two rosters, and of course, give our predictions for this weekend's game. Yeah, but Brady, I got to ask you a question. Do you like fun? I do, I do. Because guess what? Fun. I like fun. Speaking of fun, Iowa homecoming weekend as they take on the Northwestern Wildcats. And early in the game, Caden McNamara was cooking at quarterback, throwing one deep. Seth Anderson laying out for a big grab that sets up Iowa for a field goal, getting on the board first. They lead 3 0. And then a, lot, a drive later, a pivotal point in this game, Caden McNamara throws one up and it just lays out there an interception for Northwestern. This would be called back though after a late hit call. We're going to rewind the tape and look at it again. A big hit there. Keep that in mind for the next drive. But later, Northwestern, they flip the quarter and Quinn Schulte gets an interception, sets up Iowa in the red zone. But three plays later, look at that hit again from McNamara as he's looking to the right side, throws it right to the Northwestern defense instead of going for six gives the Wildcats six, and that was the last down we saw from McNamara all day. A little bit later, the defense, though, making up for the mistakes. Sticko's committee, we've got a fiver up on the board. Iowa down 7-5, and then the two teams would trade some punts, but Reese Dakin continuing the pin Northwestern within that 15-yard line, and then going into the half, Sullivan in at quarterback, hands the ball off to Caleb Johnson, and from here on out, it's just a compilation of smiles for Iowa fans. Look at this play here. And I want to point out something. Look at the right side of the screen. Brendan Sullivan, the lead blocker there on his own pass, setting up Iowa for his own touchdown. And then look at this punt here from Northwestern. Gets it down to Caden Weijin. We've seen his speed and now tiptoeing on the sideline, returns his own punt to the end zone and continuing it up. Another touchdown, you guess who? Caleb Johnson returning at 40 yards and then one drive later, it's him again, Caleb Johnson, 25 yards to the house for his third touchdown of the game and fourth touchdown of the third quarter, let alone an incredible performance from the offense when Brendan Sullivan came in, but the defense continuing to do well, putting pressure on Lausch there, the quarterback for Northwestern, getting some fumbles now. Northwestern would finish the game, returning their own punt to the end zone, but they lose Iowa's homecoming game 40-14. And Brady, now with that win, Iowa's one win away from a bowl game. Yeah, Colin, they're right there. They can feel it. They're right there to that bowl contention. But you mentioned something during that recap, Colin. You mentioned Brendan Sullivan. And in the newsroom, DITV's Joel Keller has a little bit more for us on Brendan Sullivan. Guys, it's officially Sully time in Iowa City. Brendan Sullivan is the new starting quarterback for the Iowa Hawkeyes. Trying to have a little really more again. confidence going into it that, okay, I'm, I'm in this position for a reason, and I'm, I'm going to do what I got to do. After a couple weeks of quarterback controversy for the Hawkeyes, Brendan Sullivan has now taken the reins because Cade McNamara is out with a concussion. Sullivan came in last game against Northwestern midway through the second quarter while the Hawkeyes were down 3-7. He then led the Hawkeyes down the field on a big momentum-grabbing scoring drive to go into half. Then, that set the Hawkeyes up to go 28 points in the third quarter. 
I mean, yeah, he's a dog. He's always stay consistent in his process. Uh, always stay consistent with uh, what he knows, what he believes in. And uh, he just reaped the benefits of him on Saturday. You know, he's always just been ready to go, been, been ready to play and give his all. So uh, that's what he went out there and did uh, this past Saturday. Sullivan didn't just bring an impact to the Hawkeyes by throwing and running the ball. He also made a key block 35 yards down the field after completing a pass to tight end Johnny Pascuzzi. Just the way I was raised, my dad taught me the game to, to play with full effort, full confidence, and, and just control the controllables. And so that's something I can control is, is helping my guy get more yards, and that's like, going to help the team out. I'm going to do that every time. This week, he will have the full week as QB1 to prep for the Badgers. It will also be his first start in the black and gold, so let me give you an introduction to his game. Almost all of his 211 career passing attempts at Northwestern and Iowa have been behind or within nine yards of the line of scrimmage. On those throws, he has completed 114 of them, good for 85.7%. Those have gone for 717 yards and seven touchdowns with zero picks. Sullivan has gone 10 for 24 on deep shots that are 20 plus air yards down the field. On those throws, he has gone for 375 yards with two touchdowns, but also four of his five career interceptions. So he's got that skill in the bag, but just not as efficient as the short passing game. Sullivan also brings that dual threat ability on the offense. Last game, he had eight carries for 41 yards and a touchdown, including a run pass option on fourth and two, where he took it himself for the first down. He also opened up the rushing attack last week by forcing the defense to respect the option of Sullivan running. Caleb Johnson had 107 of his 109 rushing yards when Sullivan was in at quarterback. This week we should expect more run pass options with Soli at quarterback because this is a key part of Tim Lester's offense back at Western Michigan. He hasn't been able to bring that into Iowa because of the lack of mobility from quarterback Caden McNamara. The Hawkeye offense will not improve a ton through the passing game, but the running game will be even more electric. Back to you, Colin and Brady. Thanks, Joel. Colin, it looks like Brendan could really add an extra element to the Hawkeye rushing attack this week. Absolutely. He just added a lot of depth to this team, whether it's with passing or just opening things up the defense has to prepare for. Yeah, Colin. But before we can take a look at this weekend, we got to take a little bit look to the past. These two teams have a strong rivalry between them, and of course, there's a trophy on the line. So let's go to DITV's Elise Gann to hear a little bit more about the rivalry between Iowa and Wisconsin. Thanks, guys. We have quite the Big Ten matchup tomorrow night with the Hawkeyes and Badgers, but before the lights turn on at Kinnick, let's shine some light on the history between these two teams. We'll start with their most recent feud last October, where like any other Iowa game last season, it was not pretty, but it was successful. Per usual, the Hawkeyes struggled with the passing game, only throwing for 37 yards, their lowest of the season, while the Badgers had the opposite result with 228 passing yards in total. Speaking of opposites, Wisconsin had their second to lowest rushing game of their season, putting a solid 96 yards on the board, while Iowa used the strength of their running game to their advantage, reeling in 200 rushing yards. Former Iowa running back LaShawn Williams channeled his inner 2024 Caleb Johnson, racking up 174 of those yards, 82 of them from a breakaway touchdown which ended up being the lone TD of the game. The rest of this game was a field goal war, each team with a pair, but defensive lineman Aaron Graves felt things were getting kind of boring and added some spice with the safety in the fourth, contributing to Iowa's 15-6 win. Getting a conference win is always fun, but this victory was more than just a record booster for the Hawks as they took another thing home with them as well. The Heartland Trophy is the baby of the conference trophies and now belongs to the Hawkeye Badgers series. With the history and the competitive nature behind both teams, the athletic directors agreed a trophy was needed to represent the series and its importance throughout the years, with a bowl standing on top. The Hawkeyes took the trophy home in its first appearance in 2004 and kept it in Iowa City until the Badgers ripped it by the horns of the bowl out from under them in 2006. The Badgers currently lead the trophy series 10-8, but the Hawkeyes are currently on a two-game win streak against their opponent and have the extra advantage in a blacked-out Kinnick Stadium under the lights. The Hawkeyes are determined to keep the Heartland Trophy in the heart of Iowa City and boost their win streak against the Badgers to three games in a row. 
That's all I have for today, so I'll send it back to Colin and Brady in the studio. Thanks, Elise, Colin. It is certainly a tight and hotly contested rivalry between the Badgers and the Hawkeyes. And you can't tell me you don't love that trophy with the bull on top and the rivalry against it. I mean, just a fun game every year. It is certainly a great one, Colin, but I think it's time we quit looking to the past. And I think it's time we take a little gander at this weekend's matchup. And as we've said, it's going to be a close one between two Big Ten powers. They're always good. They're big. They're athletic uh, once again. And, um, you know, second year for Coach Fickle and his staff. So they've, they've truly settled in. It's typically going to be a physical contest, good defenses, and uh, hopefully both teams, you know, are trying to run the ball a little bit and that type of thing. And they're, they're doing a really nice job. Yeah, and Kirk said it there, Brady. Wisconsin definitely a very tough team. And, you know, the stats say that too. The Hawkeyes and the Badgers look almost identical this year. Iowa scores one-tenth of a point more than Wisconsin per game, and they're holding on to their opponents to one-tenth a point less than the Badgers do as well. This game is looking like it'll be a close contest. It certainly is, Colin, and the similarities don't stop there. Both teams are currently on their second quarterback of the season. For Wisconsin, Tyler Van Dyke went down with an injury against Alabama Week 3, and since then, Braden Locke has been their guy. But neither team has been all that successful passing the ball. Lock stats all rank near the bottom of the Big Ten. But for the Hawks, as we've heard, Brendan Sullivan will be getting his first start, and he has been effective in limited action this year. Sullivan has accounted for four total touchdowns, three of those coming off runs near the goal line, so Wisconsin will have to watch out for his legs. And Brady, speaking of running the ball, Iowa doesn't just have the edge tomorrow, but they have one of the best backs in the nation. Caleb Johnson leads everything statistically rushing in the Big Ten, whether it's yards, yards per attempt, touchdowns, yards per game. I mean, you name it, Brady, he leads it. But anyone other than Ash and Jensi just looks bad compared to Caleb Johnson. Wisconsin's Tawi Walker is having a great year. He's tied for second in Big Ten for touchdowns with 10, but he's also got the sixth most yards per game. Walker is Wisconsin's lead back, and he's been effective for them. But Colin, the biggest difference in this game might just be the defensive playmakers. While both teams are ranked similarly overall defensively, Iowa might have the slight edge at the top. Iowa has a do-it-all linebacker leading the way in Jay Higgins. He leads the Big Ten in tackles by a decent margin. He also, wait, that, that can't be right, can it? He has three interceptions, tied for third in the league as a linebacker, add a sack and a couple forced fumbles, and I know I'm not in the classroom, but I think that equation equals one of the best players in the nation. That's not to say Wisconsin's without talent in the back end. Preston Zachman leads the team with two interceptions, but he makes plays all over the field, racking up 35 tackles so far this year. Now, Brady, there's one phase of the game that Iowa generally has the upper hand in, but this week I'm not so sure that's a shoe-in. Reese Higgins had a great year so far, with last week being arguably his best outing. He's down the most punts in the 20-yard line in the Big Ten, and he has the fourth most punts over 50 yards. But Wisconsin has their own Australian. Atticus Bertrams has a league-leading 74-yard punt, and that's three-fourths of the entire field. And he's tied with Dakin in punts 50 or more yards. And with what we've learned about these teams' passing games, we could definitely see a battle between these two tomorrow. So Colin, it looks like this could really be a tight game tomorrow as the Hawkeyes take on the Badgers under the lights, as we've said, in a blackout environment. But Colin, before the Hawkeyes kick off under the lights in Kinnick, there's a whole slate of games going on Saturday, of course, as with every week. So let's see what those games are with DITV Sports Director AJ Reister. Thanks, guys. I'm really excited for this weekend's game in Iowa City, but there are a ton of games around the country. Welcome to week 10 of the college football season. Only four games remain before bowl season and the college football playoffs. Every game matters, but these final four are what could decide whether teams will have their epic finale or if they'll be sitting on the couch watching other teams lift trophies. Starting in Happy Valley, the fourth-ranked Ohio State Buckeyes will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the third-ranked Penn State Nittany Lions. The Buckeyes are coming off a bounce-back win over the Cornhuskers 21-17. Will Howard looked solid throwing for over 200 yards and three touchdowns, but the run game struggled, combining for just 64 yards. But it was the defense that stepped up, combining for three sacks and an interception. On the other side, undefeated Penn State will be facing one of their first true tests of the season. And a win against the Buckeyes could propel them to the college football playoffs. 
However, they will be leaning on their backup quarterback, Bo Prabula, as Drew Aller has been spectacular all season, but left the game last weekend at the end of the first half with a left knee injury. We'll see if the sophomore backup can conquer one of the Big Ten's biggest mountains, or if the pressure will get to him and make the road to the playoffs even tougher. Kickoff is set for 11 a.m. on Fox, and the Buckeyes are three and a half point favorites. Elsewhere in the Big Ten, the Minnesota Golden Gophers are headed to Champaign for a ranked matchup with the Fighting Illini. Illinois is coming off a 38-9 loss to number one Oregon, where Luke Altmaier struggled throwing two interceptions, while Dylan Gabriel torched the defense for 291 yards and three touchdowns. Altmaier's job won't get any easier this weekend, as they will be facing one of the nation's top pass rush defenses in the nation garnering 15 interceptions, the second most this season in college football. The Gophers are coming off a 48-23 victory over the Terrapins and added two more interceptions, one of which was taken to the house by Justin Wally. Can the Gophers pull off the upset or will the Illini continue their unforgettable season? Kickoff is set for 11 a.m. on FS1 and the Gophers are three-point favorites. Outside the Big Ten, there is a massive ranked matchup in the ACC. The SMU Mustangs are hosting the Pittsburgh Panthers in a potential preview of the ACC championship. This conference has been up in the air all season, but Pitt has come out as a front runner, averaging nearly 41 points per game. Last weekend, they took down the Syracuse Orange 41-13 and picked off the former Buckeye Kyle McCord not once, not twice, not three times or four times, but five times and returned three of them for six. This team looks like it could be a problem if they sneak into the playoffs, but on the other side. But on the other side, the Mustangs of SMU have played lights out since their week three loss to BYU. And last weekend, they just out the Duke Blue Devils in a 28-27 win. Kevin Jennings, however, did struggle last weekend throwing three interceptions. And after last week's performance from Pitt, he'll have to be extra careful when airing the ball out. This game kicks off at 7 p.m. on the ACC Network with SMU as a 7.5 point favorite. That's a look around the Big Ten and the nation. Gentlemen, what games are you most excited for this weekend? Thanks, AJ. Colin, I'm going to do it again. Texas Tech is heading into Ames, taking on Iowa State. Iowa State is still undefeated. And Colin, until they lose a game, I'm keeping my eye on the Cyclones. Unfortunately, yeah, you have to keep your eye on them. I hate that you keep bringing them up, Brady. It just irks me a little bit, but at the same time, they are undefeated, could be a bye team in the college football playoff. But the game I'm looking for this weekend, Georgia Southern taking a trip to South Alabama, two of the most inconsistent teams I've seen all year. They're both dancing around 500 of the record books. South Alabama dropped like a 70 bomb on Northwestern State earlier this year. So, I mean, out of all inconsistency, we could get a real wild matchup down there. Yeah, Colin, I'm not entirely sure why that's the kind of game you want to watch. I know you kind of like some of those weirder matchups, but... All right, you do you, man, but now it's time to take a look at this week's Kid Captain. DITV's Elise Scan has the story. Only a few months into his life, it became known something about Hunter Mickelson was off. After noticing he was not gaining weight or nursing averagely, the Mickelson family visited nutritionists, specialists, and other medical experts, but none of them could provide a definite answer. Eventually, they were led to the University of Iowa Stead Family Children's Hospital where Hunter was diagnosed with an extremely rare condition that only affects 1 in 2.3 million people. Conditions called nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, and uh, even though the word diabetes is in there, it's not like the diabetes that you know we would be familiar with. His you know, brain uh, is healthy and his kidneys are healthy, but he, um, the, the, the signaling between the two is, is not healthy, so his brain doesn't tell his kidneys what it's supposed to do. Immediately after the diagnosis, the medical staff at Stead helped develop an ongoing treatment plan for Hunter to get his health to where it needed to be. Hunter received a blood transfusion, a central line to his heart, and a gastrostomy tube for nutrition. To this day, Hunter still follows his nutrition plan with the help of his three brothers, his mom, and his dad while living his everyday life. I would say he's a normal, you know, nine-year-old goofball, likes the, you know, goof around with his brothers and his friends and, and, uh, and plays sports. With his love of sports comes his love for Hawkeye football, making him being a kid captain extra special. Hunter's energy and contagious happiness is endless, and he is more than ready to spread it under the lights on Saturday. From the University of Iowa, Elise Gann, DI TV Sports. Kid captain story is always a great way 
to transition into the predictions segment of the show. Now, Colin, it's time for predictions. And last week, Elise took home the win. Two-time predictions champion, Elise. And she beat me by one point. This is the second time I've lost by one point this week. It's starting to get a little ridiculous, but hopefully that Michigan State ghost is at least gone for good. Absolutely. I mean, it was a little scary a bit, but I mean, if it took Elise winning the belt to get rid of that ghost, I'll deal with it for now. Hopefully that's the case. But let's start off with Joel in the newsroom for his Hawkeye highlight and score prediction. Thanks guys, I'm ready to give my bold prediction for the game, but first I gotta do my Hawkeye highlight and someone I'm gonna keep an eye on is wide receiver Jacob Gill. It's about time a Hawkeye receiver has a big game against Big Ten competition and Jacob Gill has the ability to do that against Wisconsin. He struggled last week, but he has been able to get consistently open on those quick five yard out routes. And as I mentioned earlier, this is Sullivan's specialty. It'll be up to Gill to get some yards after the catch if the Hawkeyes want to move the ball through the air. The Badgers are going to be a tough opponent for the Hawkeyes and they will want some revenge after what happened last year. As much as I would love to see the Hawkeyes win, I think the Badgers pull out the victory on the road 27-23. The few defensive woes of the Hawkeyes will come to light in this game and they're going to struggle to tackle some of these premier offensive talents on the Badgers. Elise, how are you going to defend your Mickey Mouse belt? Thanks, Joel. That was a little goofy of a statement, but <laughs> for my Hawkeye highlight, I have the one and only Brendan Sullivan. After our good old friend Cade McNamara didn't return from the bench after being replaced by Brendan Sullivan, the backup QB showed his stuff and is now starting on the turf tomorrow night. Last weekend against his former team, the Northwestern Wildcats, Sullivan rushed for 40 yards and passed for 80, collecting 120 yards in total. Brendan does something Iowa fans haven't seen a quarterback do in years, and that is run the ball. He is not afraid to take it for himself and consume a hit or two in the process, and I'm excited to see what he does against the Badgers. As for my prediction, I'm going to keep what's mine and say the Hawkeyes are coming out on top 28-16. I think the defense will continue to stay strong and the offense will continue to keep their momentum from last week. Well, AJ, I think this looks pretty nice on me, right? I, I think so. I can't really remember how it looks on you, though, because you haven't had it in a while, but I know you're trying to get it back, so we'll hear what you have to say. At least that's real funny. I mean, just look at last year's stuff. Just watch about any of the shows last year. You could see me wearing the belt, so. How about you hold your horses and enjoy it while you have it because it's not going to be there for very long. First, let's take a look at my Hawkeye highlight, a guy who's been struggling a bit this season, Xavier Nwampa in his junior season. Zero interceptions on the season, just 28 tackles, especially at the beginning of the year was really struggling, but the last couple of weeks started to heat up except for last weekend where he literally recorded no stats. But the week before, he almost led the team in tackles, and I expect him to have a big day, especially with Wisconsin's quarterback throwing so many interceptions this season. I expect him to get his first Saturday. As for my score prediction, I've got the Hawkeyes taking down the Badgers 33-17. We already said it's going to be a battle of punters, and I do think that the freshman Reese Dakin will have a big day, as well as Brendan Sullivan continuing to run this offense the way Tim Lester has designed it to, and the defense, of course, coming up big time with that Xavier Wampa interception. That's what I've got, Colin. I don't know if you can really beat out what I have, so I guess I'll let, take a look at what you've got. AJ, we did not have to do all that because you brought up all the times you won last year, and I kind of like that considering all the similarities we have and a lot of firsts with this week's pick. So first, with my Hawkeye highlight, I'm going with Luke Lachey. Everyone talks about Luke Lachey as a potential draft pick, especially in the higher rounds, but if he wants to do that, he's going to have to turn it up this week. He's a good spot for this tight end position against Wisconsin, against a good defense where he's going to have to block, but also I think he's going to have to score. He's without a touchdown this season. I think he's going to get his first, like JJ thinks, Xavier Nwamka is going to get his first interception. It also helps with Luke Lachey there getting a few more receptions with a little bit less of wide receiver depth. Now, Brady, we talked about it in the breakdown earlier. Could be a really close game and expected some Big Ten hard-nosed football. So if I want that belt back, I'm going to need to bring in some magic. So here's this, Brady. I'm bringing in some magic that helped me win this week. 1962 game-worn helmet is going to help me as Iowa is going to win this game. I've got Iowa winning 34-17. I believe in this offense to score and hold Wisconsin a little bit lower and keep Luke Fickle on the hot seat. Really? That just 
<laughs> you just have that? I need something. Gotta help with this head up here. It's been missing a few <laughs> weeks, so I gotta keep it safe somehow. All right, well, I'll, I'll just get right into my Hawkeye highlight then. This week, my Hawkeye highlight is Caden Weejin. He finally broke loose and scored a touchdown off a punt last week. And this week, he's taking on a punter who can boom one way downtown. So if Iowa wants to win the field position battle, and they always do, Weejin is the key. Now, I'm getting desperate. I know you brought out the helmet, but, but I'm getting pretty desperate, Colin. The curse of the host continues. Last year, last year's host, he never won either. And this year, Elise, congratulations, Elise, but she beat me for the second time this year. I've lost by one point. She beat me by one point this week. So I got to break the curse. And this week, I'm feeling pretty good. I think I got a chance to finally get over that hump. Night game in Kinnick. The Hawkeyes are wearing all black, back in black, playing in front of 70,000 screaming fans. Give me the Hawkeyes winning 21-17. These games are always close, but Iowa has the edge with a new quarterback that Wisconsin doesn't have much tape on. And they have a guy that could be in the Heisman race. Brady, we are, we're gonna get there. We're both looking to get over that hump. You've got to break a curse and I've brought up some magic this week. Colin, you've won before. What kind of hump are you talking about? You've won before. I know you got your prop, but I'm trying to break a, a generational curse for this show. I don't care. You heard Elise a, a week earlier. I'm going through withdrawal suit from that belt. I need it back, okay? Just, just, just believe me on that. All right. Well, we're, we're just going to leave it there until next week. Thank you, Joel, Elise, AJ, and you for tuning in to Before the Kickoff. Be sure to check out the Daily Iowans website and YouTube page for all the latest on Hawkeye sports. I'm Colin Carruthers. And I'm Brady Barron. Have a fabulous football-filled weekend, everybody.